Hello and welcome back to the UBF podcast, a deep dive edition, episode three. I'm Abs. I'm Thomas, and special guest who's wearing the same clothes again. Mate, no, I know. I'm back, Anthony. <laughs> what's what's with our special guests wearing the same clothes to, to, to every video? Mate, it's a theme. I don't know what it is. I think uh, B- B- Bella Vista Hotel. I think they got a changing room. I think we've got to start utilizing that. To be honest, mate, you, so. mate, you've got a whole wardrobe. You got. So. We've been through Kappa. We've been through Adidas. We've been through Nike, and you're still wearing the same hoodie. I know it's a comfy hoodie and the track pants, man. Oh, it's not at all. <laughs> Look, we've we've got Anthony on, sorry, um, with his community role, with his role within the Wanderers, with his role within the football mm. community in Australia. We decided that you know nothing better to speak about yeah. than I think one thing that we've been strong advocates for, and it's it's the development of Australia, the pro- the production line, as some people would call it. Yeah, the the you know so much of the development of our game in Australia. Mm. So I'll, I'll kick us off with you know. I think a statement that we can kind of talk about. And for me, it's, you know, the production line, the development, the opportunities at hand um, that have been the biggest problem in Australia. Um, it's excruciatingly frustrating at times and we haven't seen much progress in this area for me. Um, you know, whether that be from the structure of the development, um, whether it's the routes, the cost of playing football at a certain level and the or even the amount of funding received over the years. Um, it's just, it's ridiculous. Mm. And, and I think the development of our men's game in Australia and then the opportunities at hand, um, the pathways for, for players is is slowly, slowly dipping in my eyes. Um, you know, you want to give us a bit about the, the B-League coming in as well? Yeah, obviously us three, we've had a heaps of chats off, off air. The introduction of it in theory, I think is great. Yeah, the, for in, sure. the introduction of the B, B-League, I think is, is tops. For me though, and I know Anthony's going to agree with this, it's not going to really take effect until 2032, I think you were saying. 2032, that, that's really the big thing because it's like there's no incentive for a promotion relegation. Mm. There's, there's no sort of um, fight, desire, last match day vibes. You've got to win at all costs. It's just going to become, a th- I think, a bit stagnant in my idea. Yes, you're going to get more eyes on some more rough gems, some unknown players. Yeah. But I think it just comes back to that idea of there's not enough funding, and as a result, there's 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 no real loss if you get relegated yeah. until 2032. I think the benefit of it is is uh, is having a platform for these players because I think the current MPL um, and the way it's set up, I don't think there's enough eyes on it. I think for New South Wales, they do a you know they do a great job in terms of MPL TV and putting the highlights online and, and making sure people come to the game. But I don't think the current way it's set up, there's enough people outside of us. I know we're addicted by football, we live and breathe it, but there's not enough. Outsiders looking at NPL and being like, "What is this?" I think uh, not a lot of people know what NPL is, and there's yeah. no platform. Whereas the B League comes in, it's new, it's fresh, and it's something that you know people can talk about, and and you know the news can take coverage of. I think it just provides a better platform for the next sort of ten years. Correct. Um, yeah. And then when it comes to sort of relegation promotion 2032, I think it's uh, I think that's the next steps in sort of developing um, a great league, yep. a great league that sort of you know can can tackle the likes of AFL and NRL, but yeah. You know, there's there's that conversation about the league, but I think under that is a is a more concerning issue, and it's like how do we ensure that there's enough talent coming through? Because I think if you look at the NRO, and you know they they would have had challenges with this, and mm-hmm. they're going to face more with the sort of the concussion rules and how that's yeah. sort of impacting grassroots. But um, you know they face it. AFLs probably face the challenge yeah. as well, but you know we've faced the challenge for for however however long now. Yeah, and I just just one thing that you mentioned as well, the 2032. I, I think it's, you look at now, it's probably the 10-year-olds and 11-year-olds that will mm. benefit from it most. Mm. When you look at the, the 17, 18, 19-year-olds now that are playing in those levels, yeah, they go to NPL, you know, they play, and they're playing for a Marconi or, a, or an Apia. They're playing for an opportunity to get to the A-League. Of course they're. they're not playing of course they're. For, for Marconi to be promoted just yet. Mm. So I think the fact that they're waiting till 2032 to bring it in is only going to hamper, you know, and hurt... Yeah. Those those type of opportunities yeah. you want to talk it's about. Still, it's still something to look forward to. I think even Huge. Um, working on in the grassroots, you know, at the moment, I think it, like you said, it's going to be ten years time. The players playing now have more clubs, more mm. teams, more hopefully academies, more mm. more sort of opportunities for them to to sort of prosper and, and make it somewhere as a professional football. I think uh, if you look at it now in terms of you know sort of growing up and you know we we both grew up and wanted to be sort of professional footballers. Yeah. I know. I know I didn't <laughs> definitely cut my career short <laughs> a couple of years um, and moved to sort of back to the grassroots and, and whatnot. But um, join the club, mate. We've all been yeah, there. Yeah, looking looking at it, where's the you know you gotta you gotta sort of look at the Wanderers and Sydney FC. And it's like you know there's only however many spots. I think there's a squad of you know 30, 28, 25. Nothing else out of you know the 
in uh, Western Sydney alone, across even in our catchment, we have 125,000 football participants. Yeah. So I've got to make 25 spots currently out yeah. of the 125,000. It's, 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 it's a pretty there's scary a, there's, fa- there's a famous Croatian saying that uh, me and Anthony would know. Anthony, there's no chance. There's no chance. <laughs> there's zero chance. Nishta, nishta. Nishta, even better. But I, I think, Abdul, to go to your point as well, I think it's a, it's a crucial time and I think 2032, what well, you were saying sort of of here as well, I think the need, those clubs, your Uniteds, your Olympics, your Wollongong Wolves, they need to build that funding up mm. to give themselves. And it's not so much if they can survive in the B League, it's what happens when they get promoted. Mm-hmm. They're not going to have the funding. You, you reckon they're going to catch a plane every single time to go to Perth, to Wellington. Like what's the, is there, is there, really, a, is there really a budget for them to do that? They're celebrating the big league. <laughs> <laughs> Far out. They're that excited, eh? Mate, I'll be like, that's got think, them going, I mate. I think that's the idea, right? I think if you look at the if you look at the teams selected, the presidents, they've all, you know, they're all backed by, you know, RSL clubs or, yeah. or something like that where there is enough sort of money coming through. Like Marconi, you look at Marconi, yeah. if you're if you're a member of Southern District, it's probably the only place you can go to waste the money, you know what I mean? <laughs> so um but yeah, I think the clubs selected the club selected. There's a reason for that. I think a lot, of, a lot of clubs missed out who were yeah. you know, performing better in their current leagues in Brisbane and Adelaide or wherever they're playing. I think the, the clubs they picked, like a Preston, like a Marconi, of course. There's there's funding behind it and there's a there's a strategy behind. Yeah, it. and and going back to what you said, even if you look at other sports, you look at the NRL. Mm. You know, there's three or four clubs in the NRL that had to go into I'm not going to call it administration, but the NRL had to take ownership, and those clubs weren't supported by leagues clubs. They weren't supported by by those type of fundings. And it was during the time where they weren't in such success. Mm. I think it was St. George was one of them, Newcastle was the other one, and I'm pretty sure it was the Gold Coast Titans. And they all have to find their own funding. And that's when we talk about, you know, let's just say these Marconis and your Arpias. If they don't do well, what happens? They're it's not that, like, it's in the mud. I think, that, yeah. Yeah. It's in the I think when, you, when you're talking about funding, it's, uh, it's pretty interesting because I think it leads into our conversation about the production line. But... I think uh, someone or a club to look at at the moment is sort of Adelaide United, right? Yeah. Huge. They've got a uh, you know, Joe Gauchi, Irukunda, the Toure brothers. That's a that's a massive sort of income coming in. I don't know how much Irukunda sort of went for. I'm sure, Cords would have would have had some, some like that. Some inside yeah. information. But that sort of money is a uh, is crazy money for an for an A League club. Correct. Yeah. Um, it's something that you know we've probably had never had never had to no. experience and nothing we've no. ever had to consider. But I think now when you know club owners and you know recruitment people and scouting people and you know our current academy academy coaches. Yeah. Um, it's their role to sort of get them into position, so we can we can eventually offer them to that's Europe, it. or we can give that's them that opportunity. That's, to where the, that's where the salary cap hurts, hurts them, but because then the, the Aaron Kunda could have gone for much more than that, but it, they couldn't sell him for more than that because of the rules surrounding the A League and the salary cap. Was it because of his age as well? Did his age have something to do with it? No, his his age can't. You can't sign a centre player like a six. That's yeah. Uh, it's impossible. I don't. I'm not too sure about the the salary the mm. salary cap rules, but um. But still, with three, four million, it's um, it's massive for an early club. Trust me. Yeah, but, but for buying, I can understand his point. For buying, that that's they w- penny change. They would have paid yeah. 15, 16 million for him if they, if 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 Sydney would have, tu- uh, sorry, Adelaide would have turned around and be like, um, okay, we want fifteen million for the player. But the problem is, they get fifteen million for the player. They can only use so much of it because then they they, they can't improve their squad any more than the next club can because of their cap by a certain point. They got to give some to the A League. Yep, and then the day you look at, remember when Del Piero came through. I'm pretty sure the league they helped yeah, out. They helped the, out. That was the Marquise system back then. Yeah. That was to bring. That was when you know the Heskies came. Everyone, Shinji. all these Marquise, all these Marquis <laughs> came. Where you know they they invested a lot of money into the league to to grow it and bring these big names. David Villa played ten clubs, and we we still have that sort of system somewhat with you know Nani. But um, I think that's sort of filtering out. We're, we're seeing. I think to be honest, I understand the fact where I think from a grassroots perspective and us sort of looking into it. I think that. We look at it in this bad way, but I think in the A League as a as a whole, I think uh, the the World Cup, the men's and women's World Cup, has sort yes. of put us on the map a bit more, where we can we can sell these players and people looking at us like you could, you know, Wanderers, Keanu Keanu Bacchus, look at Callum Yulnoff, they're they're both you know sort of prospering overseas. Yeah. Even Aaron, um, Aaron Moy back in the day. Yeah, exactly. But Aaron Moy. F- for me, Abdul, I think to your point, Anthony, the FIFA men's and women's World Cup sort of put a spotlight on our league. Yeah, and we do have those players. Yeah. And I think this B-League will only help. What I'm interested more in is our communities that we sort of grow up in. 
Yeah. Obviously, we're both of Croatian descent. Yeah. And obviously, you are uh, Lebanese. Yeah. So, uh, UBF, apparently, he's a fake leb. He's not, I can assure you. Yeah, whoever that, that Garnacho <laughs> guy is on TikTok, mate, he just keeps calling him fake leb. I'm true Lebanese, mate. Mate, if you want to go see his house, it's just got leb flags there. <laughs> <laughs> for me, though, it's like, I'll speak first about my Croatian heritage and happily to do so. Obviously, you're from the Hills area. I'm from sort of Southwest. And for me, it's like, I, I take my heritage everywhere and I'm very mm. proud of it. Mm. I'm very proud to sometimes good and bad, but it's... I sort of grew up in that community where if United played, we're talking about Sydney United here, Sydney United played, they won, my household was happy for the week. Mm. If we lost, the household was gone. Yeah. Dad was angry, he's not cooking for the whole week, mum's not cooking, we're getting leftovers, he finished. Mm. Yeah. But I think that sort of nationalistic approach, the NPL, we'll talk about the, how it got dissolved in 2004, whatever, whatever it may be. But for me, I think we need to sort of not put an ethnic-based approach on our league mm. but Australia itself is a multicultural country yeah and I think we have to start embracing that more not turn away from it I think we should let that shine like you look at Irakunda's message when he was at our when he was at Alliance Arena and he was so proud of his heritage so proud he got the flag and he shone it proudly and he did a lap of honor with his flag I forgot what his nation is but so proud and he calls Australia home we should be honored about that but I think still and a lot of Croatians and our our clubs in United we sort of don't look well onto the A-League because of what happened and I think we still hold a bit of grudge but we're here this is the A-League yeah. and we've got to accept it and the B-League United is one of those four teams from Sydney but we've got to start embracing who we are and mistakes have happened we've not made none of those mistakes we're not involved in those decisions so we've just got to start embracing. We've got to put our Croatian heritage on it. Mm. We've got to put our Leb Lebanese spin on it. We've got to put our Italian, Greeks, whatever heritage you may be. Yeah. Embrace. Just, just quickly, thank you to King Tom, um, King Tom Club, because otherwise without them, we wouldn't have been in the P League uh, without, without record in the media. So thank you. Just a quick shout out. <laughs> but thanks for cutting me off. But um, we've just got to start embracing who we are and put our Australian twang on it. Mm. Anthony, give us a little spin about your Croatian heritage. Uh, Croatian heritage. Lucky to say that I never supported uh, Sydney FC growing up. I think we only went Good to a, we only went to a Denza Park um, on a Sunday. So I think that was that was that was me growing up. But I yeah. think uh, it sort of says a lot about me and my sort of history in football. Right? Like I, I think I said off here, I was never a Premier League person. I was never a Euro snob. I was yeah. never one of those. I grew up watching Australian football. I grew up watching Sydney United. I grew up watching um, the A League. Yeah. Right? I never I never grew up watching Liverpool. I never grew yeah. up watching Manchester United. So I've got a pretty pretty rare sort of story in Australia yeah. because I think a lot of us who grow up, 90% of us, if you were, you know, talking to our football friends at, at, at school, it's never, um, you know, did you watch the A-League? It's, you know, did, did you see Man United? It's, yeah, um, it's a different thing. So I was never a part of those uh, those, uh, those conversations. So I, I guess that's my sort of interesting take on, on Australian football is that I've, I've, it's only been me. Um, it's only yeah. thing I know, right? So And that's what I think with you, you've got a unique perspective on it mm. because you only know the A-League. You yeah. only know the NSL days. Whereas me and Abdul, we sort of, due to the UBF podcast, we have to be well versed in the Premier League. Sure. And we can't get rid of this product that we have here. No. Do you want to give us a quick uh, little rundown of your Lebanese heritage? Yeah, look, like, especially where I'm from, I'm from the Canterbury Banks scenario. So I, I'd, I'd say that we're predominantly rugby league area as well. Mm. So when it comes to, and going back to what you said about culturally attached to clubs, it's, it's not so much, and I think you'd agree with me with the NRL, you don't necessarily find certain nationalities attached to the clubs. It's, this is the area. Yep. You represent this area. Mm. You know, if you're from, you know, that Canterbury Bank Sun region, you're a Bulldogs fan. If you're around Kogra, Illawarra, Wollongong, you're a Dragons fan. And what I grew up, and that's how I saw it, is that, you know, the Doggies games on a Sunday, everyone gets together. We have a barbecue. Yeah. You know, we win, we win, we lose. Like you said, you know, everyone's pissed off. You know, you see chairs thrown out on the front lawn and all of That's that. It. So for me, when it comes to football, and, you know, I've had discussions with you, I've had discussions with, with um, you know, producer Julian, you guys grew up around the MPL. You grew up around these, like, you know, your Marconis and, and your Prestons mm. and your Sydney Uniteds where it is attached culturally. You know, Marcon Marconi... Yeah. Is, is an Italian club, Sydney United being a Croatian club. So for me, we don't uh, we don't have, Leb like, you know, as Lebanese backer, we don't have a club. And yeah. I think it goes back to even, like, just touching on that point, like the Wanderers, when the Wanderers came in, it was all about 
the West, right? I, I support Correct. Wanderers to this day because it represents who I am. I don't support it because, you know, it's the, my, my local club. It's, uh, it's an encapsulation of, of me. Great point. Of me, and I think I watched the I watched the podcast just before. I think we were just talking about Rashid Mahazi's new podcast. Mm. I don't know if you've seen it, but he spoke about sort of the, the cultures alongside uh, alien clubs, and there's none. Yep. There's none. Zero. But but to me, but to me, Wanderers is is all about culture and who we are as uh, as people. And I think going to your point, I think we need more about that. More 100%. with that, and I think the the B League would do that. Yeah, and and for me as well, with you, as uh, Rashid was saying, and yourself, the Western Sydney. And I 100% agree with you. That's why I supported. And I'll never forget the day, April the 4th, 2012, when it got announced. The Western Sydney is a cultural melting point. It's just a cultural melting point. Yeah. It's so multicultural. And I think there's no better person that we could have had on to discuss the role in terms of we've got nine LGAs and that you sort of have a little connection in each and you sort of well-verse. And you've got a crucial role here to play sort of to connect all of them. Yeah, and, in, and call it Western Sydney. Yeah, I think it's a it's a, it's a crucial role because I think it's a it's a new role. So if you don't know uh, what I what I do, I think most of it is around our grassroots club. It was a it was a new role um, from our from our CEO. He, he saw he saw a touch point which we've sort of I guess a lot of the A League sort of neglected, which is the foundation of our which is mm. the foundation of football, which is grassroots, right? I Correct. Think, uh, in our area, I touched on it before. Uh, we got one hundred twenty five thousand participants. We're across nine sort of football associations um, and amongst that there's 218 sort of grassroots wow. clubs, right? So it's massive. And, you know, even Canterbury Bankstown, like that Bankstown area has, you know, 9,000, 10,000 members who play football. Like it's not yeah. a small, it's not a small number. By it's, any uh, means. It's, a, it's a massive. And I think, uh, you know, our role, especially my role is, you know, sort of develop them as a, as a fan. Obviously, I think that's, that's a crucial part of our role, especially at that young age uh, and developing as a fan. But we also play that role in, in pathways, right? So we do a lot in, you know, regionally where there's not a lot of opportunities like uh, Canberra, Orange, uh, Bathurst. And, you know, yourself as being a coach, you've been down there to, yeah. to sort of see the kids and get those touch points as a under the Wanderers brand. Yeah. So I think it's um, yeah, a crucial, crucial role. I've and like one part of my experience that I actually haven't mentioned on the podcast is when I was 15 and 16, mm. Um, I was an ambassador for the NRL for my school, and I was able to spend two weeks going out with the um. The in- it's called in league and harmony. Mm. So I was able to spend two weeks, go out, go to the schools, see different areas. I think at the time we ended up going to a juvenile school as well. I understand what you mean. You know the impact that sport has on these communities, it's whether huge. whether it's you know culturally, socioeconomically, whether it's even religion, sexuality, whatever you want to call it, the inclusiveness of sport. And I go back to saying even with comp- the, the other side of it with the NRL is that there's no cultural attachment to it. Yeah. It's a, you, you embrace your area. However, we shouldn't let that go. We shouldn't be like the NRL. Yeah, sport. No. Sport is is a vehicle for change, right? Yeah. Very uh, true. It, yeah. you, it, it plays this special role that you don't usually get in other sort of businesses, or you know, there's no community service who can touch someone like sport. It plays on your emotion. It plays on your values. It plays on you know, especially I go back to emotions, right? Yeah. Uh, we, we we play Sydney FC on, on Saturday. We win that game. The rest of the week is the rest oh. of the week. Is good. Yeah. Right. I come see Bar- if Barolo comes to my training session. Yeah. And now he's my role model. Yeah. Now there's kids who you know probably especially in Western Sydney yeah. don't haven't had that opportunity right. regionally. Haven't had that opportunity to to sort of meet somebody who who they can look up to, who can, they can inspire. And I think that's a uh, that's the crucial role that you know the Wanderers are trying to do. That makes their year. Exactly. That makes their whole year. Yeah. That one that one five second interaction. Makes it whole year. Um, even even the, the little things like you see you see someone like you. Like for example, for me, I come from a Lebanese background. Mm. We don't have the most prominent presence in, in Australian sport. So we've had your Hazmal Mazaris, your Robbie Farahs, you know, Hazmal Mazari, mate. What a player! <laughs> Pleasure again. One of the best goal kickers I've ever mate, seen. During Sorry, this is a football podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Look, during no, no, during during my work experience with the two weeks that I spent doing that, Hazm was in the second week. So I, I got to spend quite a bit of time and got to know him properly. And, mm-hmm. and it shows that, you know, when you're in that position and if it's the right player, they know that they have that importance. You mm-hmm. know, for me, even, you know, I'm a tall guy. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a big bloke at the end of the day. Tall so, <laughs> By the way, if this guy stands up on camera, six foot five, easily. <laughs> six, like six, a, six, he actually gets a very Six foot five, five, easily. Mate, <laughs> mate, if I wear the right shoes, maybe six, seven. Um, <laughs> no, nah, but like, you know, I, growing up, I used to see, you know, even when I was 13, 14, 15, your, I, used, I grew up playing footy. Mm. By footy, I mean rugby league. Sam Cassianos, your David Clemmers playing for the Dogs. They're big guys. 
And I used to play, I'm like, okay, I used to model my game around David Clemmer because I saw that he was like me. He was tall, he was lankier, and you just mm. run and you hit hard. And then I think it's important, even from you and the stuff, like you, you mm. see your, you know, you talk about Luka Modric, mm. you know, because, <laughs> I go back to that, because Darren. you see, you know, yourself, that's a Croatian, yeah. a Croatian man yeah. like yourself that's gone and hit the levels and acted as a good role model for you. For me though, I think, I want to sort of touch the women's game because yeah. I think the Matildas really do that well. How many times have they sort of engaged with the community? How many times have they done meets and greets? Mm. They went to Combank Stadium, I think, and they did um, Alana Kennedy and yeah. was it Caitlin Ford came down and yeah. they just did signatures and they, they took their time. And I think the growth yes. of women's football is only going to make your job more fun. Yeah. It's only going to make your job more interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And it's only going to make more fans to come and join the West Sydney Wanderers. Yeah, it's a, it's a unique opportunity. I think even looking at the A-League, I think the A-League memberships of, uh, for women's memberships have increased like 669%, right? So yeah. it's, a, it's crazy. But Skyrim. I think um, in terms of women's, it's unique because I don't think we've, uh, we've ever experienced this in a, in a sport for women, right? I think the, the Matildas uh, at the World Cup created role models that I don't think we, we probably expected. No. Um, and I think you're seeing that sort of that sort of flow and effect now in terms of what what everyone's trying to do to sort of engage these communities and you know even you know I can only touch on the Wanderers in our in our future Wonder Women program, but you know we we've got a we're providing a platform for free for the best sixty kids to to come train for free for twenty weeks, and that's that's giving them the opportunity to to sort of train continuously throughout that week and give them an opportunity. I never to knew that. Well, wow. that's, so, that's 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 amazing. You know, this I think. Uh, yeah, well, last year we had about 400 registrations, but yeah, I think it, it well, will eventually lead to, to sort of a Wanderers Academy and, yeah, and that for women. But uh, even even something like that, a free a free program for these for these girls and giving them that uh, that opportunity. To them, so I've well, we've gone and done some some research during the mm. week. Um, I'm going to run through a few of our Matildas and the communities and the clubs that they've come from, and some of these girls, you know, they've come up out of nowhere. And, and it shows you, you know, that there is that pathway in women's football. So, about Ellie Carpenter. So, she played uh, juniors for Kara and District Junior Soccer Club. Uh, that's in the central uh, central west of New South Wales. Steph Catley played her first junior football at East Bentley FC in Melbourne. Okay. Then played at Sandringham Soccer Club, which is today the biggest women's program in Bayside. Um, Courtney Nevin played for Oakville Ravens at Blacktown before going to Parkley and Blacktown Spartans. A local junior. I thought so. <laughs> Where's she Local now? Junior. Leicester City. Leicester City. Yeah. Um, Cooney Cross was playing her junior football in Victoria for Ballarat City. Top goal scorer for the under 16s at the age of 12. Okay. Um, Fowler played her junior football local to me, Bankstown City. Mm. Um, and she also played at the Illawarra Stingrays. Caitlin Ford played at the Rilla Wanderers and Illawarra Sports High. The women's game for me, in terms of the development, doing excellent job. Excellent. Absolutely. If there's a talent, there's a talent. There's no none of this BS where it's oh you're not paying enough, you're not doing this. And the best example of this is Queensland. I was, gonna, I was just about to read a quote. For me, we've had ten Matildas come from Queensland Academy of Sports. Yeah. In 2023 World Cup, do you know that? Ten Matildas from from Queensland mm. from their Academy of Sports, and there can I give it a shout out to uh, to Robert. Mm. The FF, um, FQ, Football Queensland CEO. Robert Cavallucci. That's the one. Mate, I'm not Italian. Is that I can't, Italian? Yeah, <laughs> I can't pronounce it. <laughs> For me, they understand the importance of inclusiveness and keeping it based on how good you are. Not about how you can pay or oh, if you don't know that person, you can't get in. And listen, we're, we're not going to sugarcoat it. There is, a, there is a... Talking politics, eh? There is a... For me, there is... It's, it's, it's football in general. We won't go into politics I'm, too much. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much the best The best way to put it in this sense is that, and I, I read a quote from our coach Rodan during the week. At the end of the day, when it comes to men's football to a ground roots level, you know, if you're naturally a centre back or even if you're naturally a striker and you're somehow the best defender on the team, where are they playing you? At centre back. Makes sense. Okay. At the end of the day, if, you're, if your dad has, you know, a sponsorship or he owns a, I don't know, a plumbing company mm. and clearly um little joe is the worst footballer on the team but his dad's gonna invest five six seven eight thousand dollars into the club yeah little joe's starting every week for me in the women's game i, I don't think that happens as much no because talent's talent that will pick out a talent and and again like th that's what I, I read about it and i understood that rodan comes again another like he comes from a croatian background so he kind of understands that sense of it, there's, there's, there is politics behind it. But then they, you know, 
it's it's okay to kind of call it out for what it is. Of course it is. Listen, it, it's well known. For me, though, you can't argue with numbers. Queensland government, mini roos, $50 to register for the year. Juniors, 66. Seniors, 150 to register. I'm at I'm at my local club here, Southwest. Man, I was about to bring this up. I have I have a four hundred and fifty dollar fee ready to go for Friday. How mate, much are we paying? Though? I've got four seven five ready to go. Yeah. yeah. It's mate, that's unbelievable. Yeah. I know. Whereas four seven five, four fifty, four seven five, mate, that's a, a squad of eighteen for the seniors in football Queensland. Tom Tom. That's to, unbelievable. To be honest with Good you, the, the club the undisclosed club that we're playing for. Yeah. That's cheaper than the last club I played for. I was paying six hundred or something. That's disgusting. And and that's disgusting. Like, go give us give us the quote because I think Robert has actually has actually said yeah. said it perfectly. Our game prides itself on being welcoming for participants of all age and backgrounds, mm. and this decision reflects football's queens and commitment to supporting the ongoing growth of the game by ensuring football remains accessible for all Queenslands amidst the cost of living pressures. Mm. Yeah, I just think what he's doing is just limiting sort of those barriers of. Well, like of entry it, and participation. Breaking right? down. Especially for uh, the, the women's community, right? There's always that extra barrier of, you know, the stigma around women playing football. And, you know, it's, it's real. Yeah. It's real and you don't want to hide that. But I think something like that just sort of breaks down that sort of initial barrier. Anyway. Yeah. And and going back to to the whole, you know, when we were going through the, the Matildas, you look at someone like Mary Fowler. Mary Fowler was born in Darwin, okay? And she's, I think, 20, turning 21 or she's 21 now. Okay, She comes from, again, a diverse background. Okay, born in Darwin. I think she moved. I think I was reading into it yesterday. She moved to the to the Netherlands for a little bit with with her parents, and then moved back to to Sydney. Okay, she was playing for Bankstown City. I'm from that area. Mm. And at the end of the day, I've seen a lot of talented men and boys come through the system that should get should be getting that opportunity, but unfortunately they can't. Yeah. Like you know, the the socioeconomic status in a lot of parts of Western Sydney, and you've seen it going out to communities, isn't the same across the board in Sydney. You go out to the eastern suburbs and we've talked about it you look God at your, yeah. your pictures you look at you know the funding that goes into these even the pictures that we play on mm. the council doesn't they can't put as much funding and as much income into there as they would like because of the other things they have to take care of so when you see someone like mary fellow who's come through the bank sound system go to the level she has she's now at manchester city she's a matilda star she's a wsl star it's 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 galvanizing my my, my question to the both of you is here is that we see these examples of women's players breaking through the women's game. How do we translate that into the men's by terms of getting these players a shot by making them stand out? And also, how do we eventually apply that into the A-leagues, men's and women's? Easier said than done. Sorry, I'm, you're, you're going to have a much more... Just, um, <laughs> the million-dollar question everyone's trying to answer, man. Yeah. Like it's hey, a, mate, we brought the expert a, on for the question. That's it's, <laughs> a, it's a question that's going gonna, it's gonna to take time. The Queensland Academy of Sport, as we talked about before, has had 10 Matildas from, come, come through there in the last World Cup. Mm. Okay. And I was reading into their website and I was reading into the FAQs, if you want to call them that, and the reviews and everything. That is an academy that genuinely wants to create superstars. That is an academy that genuinely isn't there to just take your money and train you. You know, they're there to, they're taking away the elitist side of sport yeah. that, that we see with the men's game. You know, a lot of people that grow up and go into academies on the men's side of the game ultimately fail to reach that level because it's such an elitist sport. And if you can't yeah. afford to get to, you know, and, and it goes back to the funding. Like we said, I think rowing gets more money than, than football. I was about to, just about to tell him if he didn't know. Yeah. It's, it's like uh, after the 2022 World Cup, uh, ABC Four Corners did an investigation into the government funding. Mm. Rowing, do you know anyone that rows? <laughs> Good answer, thank you. <laughs> no, only, only me in Croatia, man. <laughs> <laughs> do you know anyone in... Do, no, no. What about paddleball? No. I, I, to be honest, I don't even know what paddleball was. Paddleball and rowing mm. gets more funding than Australia. It gets more funding than football in Australia. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. It's like, that's incredible. And yet we've got the biggest participation in his association, mm. 125,000 participants. Yeah. I'm sure that's more than rowing and paddleball combined nationally. Yeah. Yet 2.3 million... And you want to try and spread that out across the A-leagues, grassroots and community levels. We're not even mentioning um, uh, inclusive sport. Yeah. Women's sport. Yeah. 2.3 million. Brother, I've seen a house in Bella Vista go for more than that. How are you supposed to do that? I Shout out Bella Vista. <laughs> Mate, great food. No. But seriously, how? I know. Like, how are we supposed to spread out that money? 
I was going to say, like, you've, you've made a very valid point there. Hey. Now, that considered, Anthony, that considered of the model that Queens are using, considered that, you know, the, the way the women's game is growing, has grown, and, and is going to reach the level that it has, and how the production line has come through there. What do you think your solution would be, considering that you've involved yourself in the communities, you've gone around, and I think an important part of it is you working in Western Sydney, because I think Western Sydney... You know, it's it's home to a lot of talented people. It's extremely unique. It's a, uh, yes, uh, over a FC or a Mariners or a Jets. Because at the end of the day, for me, and I'm not saying that you know I'm not gonna throw a blanket over it, but a lot of people in Western Sydney play football because it's an escape. They love it. It's their life. Yeah. I th- they're, they're, a lot of them, yes, they dream about the big, the big star, the big stage, and 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 getting to that level. But at the same time, they will continue to play it through their late twenties because they the love of it. Whereas you know, you go to certain areas, well-equipped areas of, of Sydney, and you find that a lot of people will make it to a certain level because they can pay their way through it. They can afford to pay their way through it. How do you, how would you apply your, I'm going to call it expertise or experience in that area to mm. help fix the problem that we have at hand? Yeah, I think my whole idea about it is just decreasing and reducing that sort of barrier of, you know, the barriers of participation and opportunity, right? Like if you look at it, Western Sydney as a whole, there's there's so many uh, communities communities who don't get that sort of opportunity. I think even if you look at the stuff we're doing now in terms of like our, our new after school care yeah. program, right? Yeah. Where we've got a we've got an area where 40, 40 schools don't get uh, I don't know their their, Basic. their average yeah. their average household income is, yeah. is, is 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 below the poverty line where we're providing a platform for them to play football after school, right? Mm. So something like that, which is a uh, which is government funded, mind you, it is yeah. it is government funded, is a is a great way. But for me, it's all about barriers of, of opportunity, barriers of participation. Uh, you know, a, a kid out of Blackdown might not get the same opportunity as a kid um, out of the East. I think mm. it's, uh, it's it's very crucial to sort of sort of pinpoint that, and you know, the families, you know, the the cost of living is only getting more. More expensive as we speak, and um, I think the ensuring that these kids can play affordably and can access uh, f- great facilities is, is, is key. Um, but I think it it all comes down, especially for that next level, is the pathway, right? It's like where is the structure from from grassroots mm-hmm. to the next step and to the A League? Like where what does that look like? And it needs to be outlined clearly to everybody who wants to do it. I think that's actually above the Wanderers. I, I think that's an Associ- not association. I think that's a FA. FA. Exactly. You, uh, well said. I think it's a. It needs to be a national body that makes that really clear and obvious in black and white. Clearer, clearer than black and white. It needs to be made clear. Yeah. And then the fact that the Wanderers are going out and doing this, it and means the that they've identified this. Yeah. They've seen it. And I, I'll be honest with you. Like, um, me, me, and my Ali had a. We jumped in and played with. Um, a friend of ours team on the weekend mm. and we played against his under 17s because he coaches the amount of talented players I saw in there under 17 they're 16 mm. and they were going at these grown men and I'm talking mid 20s so these guys can play but make it clear these grown men either really really close to make it ex professionals yeah. or have played in the NPL scheme yeah so they've yeah, talented talented players talented players and these are under 16 like these are boys still going into their own their own bodies still trying to find themselves. And if, if they keep going at it, yes, there's an opportunity there, but at the same time, you ask yourself, can that can they sustain it? Can It's not affordable. Like, it's as simple as this. I think it's looking, not affordable. Yeah. I think looking uh, sort of from, from the outside, there's, there, everyone's got their, everyone's got their own different sort of motives, right? You got, you got these, all these private academies popping up where it's like, I want, I want money, but I also want to develop you. Or you've got the A-League who have their certain roles. You've got the FA who's sort of looking at participation and, you know, creating those pathways. I think everyone is sort of doing their own sort of thing mm. and there's no sort of alignment and, and, yeah. and core goal. I think, you know, no matter what they want to say, if it's, you know, we're all focused on community or we're all focused on pathways or we're all focused on uh, participation, uh, yeah. They can make up whatever they want to say, but it's not a unified. Everything, yeah. everything is unified, and you know, Wanderers might be doing, you know, our our way of it, yeah. and you know, we're, we're we're looking at a you know a strategy or a guideline, but you know, is that is that linked with you know, FA? Is there yeah. communication between the Wanderers and FA? Is there communication between Wanderers and Football New South Wales and the subsidiaries of FA? Of um, you know, I know in my role personally, I know that there's communication between the A League and, and grassroots clubs consistently. I don't know if that's happening across. You know, all the other A League clubs, but I don't know in our club, yep. it's you know, it's happening all the time. Like gonna I can assure you it's happening all the time. So yeah. um, you know, it's exciting I think from our perspective of things, but looking as a, a, a 
at everyone. Yeah, um, there needs to be some sort I of alignment. I think I'm, I want to summarize it before we wrap it up. I think at the you know there's a few points we can take out of this. I think for one, for me, is kind of our cultural diversity, our cultural background, and the way other sports have done things. Like we said, with with the NRL, you know, you look at that diversity in there. You look at, you know, the number of Polynesian players in there has grown so much over this last 10, 15 years to the point now where I think last I checked, it was 52% of NRL players are Polynesian. Crazy. Can you imagine, and coming from someone who hasn't, you know, I'm, Leb I'm Lebanese Muslim. So I've necessarily, you know, for me, it's Hazem al -Majri. You know, he grew up in, in the same area that I did. He, you know, same background, same, and he was a good role model for us. You, know, you look at the Polynesian kids in those communities, you know, you see because the registration's cheap. You can play, you know, you can have five, six, five, six of your kids and your cousins and yeah. all of that all play at an affordable price. And it would still cost less than football. And and it would still you could yeah, and it would still cost less than putting one child to play in football. You look at like I said, there's there's so many good examples, you know, your your Brian Tottos, your Stephen yeah. Crydens, you know, even even the leaders back in the day, you got your Roy Satasis, what Sunny Bills become. You know, these type of players actually, you know, they're a good example for for these kids, but at the same time, there's a pathway there. I think you know Australian football needs to take a page out of that, even with the AFL. I'm not just going to use that. Or the AFL, they've got their their um, I think it's called the uh, the Aussie the, the kids one, the the Aussie rules. They go out to schools. Something. Yeah. You know, they they have, you know, the, the halftime games. They get the kids involved. And it's not just little boys, it's the little girls as well. Yeah. They get involved. Yeah. And they're growing their, their women's game as well. And that that's improving. It's it's still a rough game in terms of the, the skill and development. But that game's growing too. And they're showing progress. I think we've seen it with the Matildas. We've seen it with the women's side of the game in this country. I think it's time that they just bust these floodgates open and give these opportunities. And yes, the B League might help. It might create more games, more opportunity for you know like you said sydney sydney united yeah. you know the croatian marconi yeah. the italian you know it might show them that there's there's a pathway but i think it's time you kind of what we're trying to say before we wrap up is there's a massive opportunity anthony after this uh world cup myself and abdul attended a game myself and matthew attended a game mm. th there's a massive opportunity now and this opportunity doesn't come every one two three it happens after a world cup and to host the world cup in our country it's a massive opportunity. And there is a window of opening now yeah. and we've got to seize it. 2032 for me too far away. is too far away yeah. and this opportunity is going to go. Yeah. You've got to go now and the Wanda has taken a brilliant step with that after schools care, as you were saying, and your, your role specifically to promote football as a game for everyone and to promote it sure. where there is a pathway yeah. to actually become a successful, and everyone's motives are different for sure, but there is a, there is a pathway. It's just about getting that streamlined and making it a unified process across the A-League's men's and the women's side. To whoever needs to hear this, you need to give these guys a purpose. You need to give them a reason to pay, to play, not just to pay, to play as well. So, like it's like I said, bust these gates open. What's what's the harm? You know, you're including everyone. You're giving people a reason to play and not just feel like, you know, they're going to spend three and a half, four grand to just play for three years and then go do their uni degree. No. No, no, he needs to, you know, whoever it is, he needs to see that end goal. He needs to see that he has a pathway directly to to the Wanderers and not just through through payment, through his own skill. Yeah. I've seen way too many people with that much talent that probably would have got an opportunity in England or in Spain or in France if they played through their ground roots that don't get it here. So what you're saying is that meaning... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to make so, the exact same. So what you're saying is myself and Anthony can <laughs> definitely still get a chance. I mean, look, if... if wait, the, depending which way you're going to... If you want to move to France or play in their third league, you might actually get would, an opportunity. I, I, I would never go to France, just to make that clear, <laughs> abundantly. But no, nah, all, all, all jokes aside, all jokes aside, I, I think there is... We've seen it with the women's game and it works. Yeah, that's it. It's it's simple as that. It's transferring that, and as we said, we just got to make a streamline. It's simple as that. And I think the Wanderers are doing a brilliant step in that. Yeah, and, and and like we said, credit to the Queensland government, credit to the people in the head of this women's game because they've they've really, really, really taken that opportunity. Yeah. But look, I think we're going to leave it there. Uh, I think Anthony, you've you know compared to the discussion we had, I think week two of this podcast, you've you've brought a different light to it. And I think having someone who's within the communities understands it, coming from the background as well that you are from, um, it gives a different light to it. Yeah, for sure. I think it's big times ahead, for, especially for you know sort of Australian football. So yeah. I'm quite excited, and and hopefully you sort of you know everyone sort of absolutely, and and, and also don't don't underestimate your role that you have in that. No, yeah. For sure, no, don't underestimate you. You've I got a, you've a got a crucial role. <laughs> 
you got a, you got an absolutely massive role, and hopefully the Wanderers' approach can sort of streamline into other clubs. Yeah. But we'll leave it on that. Hopefully, mate, it won't be the last time on the podcast. Oh, absolutely, I hope not. Uh, 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 mate, hopefully, you've enjoyed your time, and we'll go through there. I think Abdul's going to give you a little thing to sign oh, off, grateful. have a bit of momentum. Grateful, grateful. But um, before we do sign off, we'll get a, we'll get Anthony to do the momentous sign off. Beautiful, mate, mate. These days, I heard you charging fifty or forty bucks for an autograph. Oh man, mate, it's not that much. You're joining the the likes of Kevin KG, George, and Claudio Fabiano on that ball as a guest. <laughs> shout so. out, shout out KG, just real quick. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to message him that I was I was on this. I'll put my mate, Sporty up. Rovers, beautiful club. Thanks, Anthony, boys. up there as well. Pleasure. Up there. Shout out UBF. Fala. Thanks, you. boys. We have we have been UBF. Uh, I have been Thomas. I've been Abs. And special guest. Anthony Jakusevic. <laughs> Stay like a crow before we go. <laughs> Anthony Jokovic. Hey, Ciao. Thank you. Thank you, Bella Vista Hotel. And New Eurovision, New Eurovision as well. Ciao. <laughs>